everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. Native news and information, I'm Jeannie Green. Every week in Heartbeat Alaska, we travel to remote villages throughout the state and share the lives of the people there. And today, we travel to the Northwest Village of Unalakleet. For what? For a science fair. I'll be back with Unalakleet and lots of fun right after this. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation your full-service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. And thank you, Alaska Commercial Company, for your support. These days, science seems to be on everyone's minds with major important issues such as global warming, issues like how far can you launch a potato? Or how does a volcano work? The students in Unalakleet, Alaska have the answers. Unalakleet, Alaska sits on a gravelly spit at the end of a river sharing the town's name. People in the area fish, hunt, trap, and smoke their food in much the same way other villages in Alaska do. They also had an especially abundant herd of caribou nearby for many years. The herd recently moved out of the village's hunting lands, but that's all right. There's plenty else to live off in the area, not to mention the convenience of air-mailed food and beverages. This is the igloo. It used to be uh, have games in it and movies and stuff was down there and they moved it up. This is the old native store. With a population that hovers around 750, people here share each other's concerns, hopes, and stories. salad and some rice and maybe some asparagus. Of course, the population is growing here just like everywhere else. <laughs> Longtime residents are in a good position to notice the influx of people. They remember the way things have changed through the years and the stories of past generations. Oh, well, my name is Ellsworth Hogan. <laughs> And I've been here in Unalakleet for 49 years of last August. Not the uh, yes, the Unalakleet Corporation eight plex. There was nothing in this area when I came in. I'm one of the elders. I I'm going on 76 years old, and uh, I lived here most of my life. The first, first missionaries came here back in 18, 1898. That was actually Carlson. He came from Chicago area and was, was the first missionary to come to Unalakleet. According to my brother-in-law, Stan Kajtag, that he, when actually Carlson first came here, he was surrounded by the people and want to know what's he doing here. They all talked Eskimo at that time. And he was, uh, he was saved by this one old, uh, one of our elders name is uh, old man Sherlock. He invited them to be in his house to stay away, you know, because there were a lot of people going after the, after the missionary. 
he thought they might be, you know, put them away for good. Nowadays, cultures and religions here have reconciled. People have adopted updated methods of subsistence, and life has settled into the rhythm of this area. What's the bottom Mary? Mary? The ways of days past are still seen in the dog races and subsistence gathering, and people reminisce about storms that washed out the streets years ago. Well, we've had a lot of storms in the summer where it washed out the seawall and high water come up. And there's a house over here where I'll show you how far the water has come up. This is the Assembly of God Church. Modern times have insinuated their footprint on the village's path, however. Snow machines, or snow goes, as those in the know call them, have become the vehicle of choice nowadays, replacing dog sledding as everyday transport. There's even a restaurant in town, Peace on Earth, that the Hansen family runs when they're not cooking up culinary masterpieces at home. Yeah, sometimes I practice at home for stuff that I'm going to cook next door. That's where I started pizza. Started pizza at home, so I knew I could do it whenever I started the restaurant. Got it then? Salad? Yes? No? <laughs> the restaurant's pizza delivery comes in handy, especially to basketball players after rough home games against rivals like Point Hope. Basketball is a large part of life in rural Alaska, and Unalakleet's high school team is one of the best in its league. Everybody who's anybody shows up for home games, packing the stands with cheers for the players. This past winter, however, for a few hours, coaches, pom-poms, and basketball jerseys yielded the gymnasium to a different event. How did it turn out? Did you get any crystals on that one? No, we're gonna get any You're gonna lift it up so I can see? Yeah, see, it's just like a syrup. Well, uh, the pod four science teacher and I coordinated the event the science fair today for um, all of our students. So all of the seventh through 12th grade graders were participating in the science fair. So in my classes with the junior high students, um, basically for the last four weeks, I've kind of uh, guided them through um, step by step the scientific process in order to come up with a culminating uh, project for the science fair today. My name is Axel Kitschtag, I'm eighth grade. We did a volcano to test the effects of different amount of baking soda on height of eruption. Um, I was trying to see if how the exhaust affects how fast the plant grows. Some of these leaves on the exhaust plant died like at the bottom and most of these are alive at the top from the exhaust plant. In a bit to get kids interested in environmental issues and the future of their own village, the World Wildlife Fund agreed to help sponsor the science fair. We had some um, local people, in fact there were some elders uh, that was involved in this. We had some um, council members from our native village of Yenlikli, they were part of it. Henry Oyumuk coordinated this agreement through a contact in Norway, adding to a global warming awareness initiative the Wildlife Fund is promoting. He thinks that getting kids interested in protecting their natural surroundings is essential. And it doesn't hurt if they work in their future careers at the same time. My main goal is to give the kids an opportunity to be competitive once they leave school. You know, that's, that's really essential for 
our students, you know, coming from a small school in rural Alaska and to let them uh, see what the outside possibilities would be and then coming back to a small community to hopefully work and, and uh, help their own people. People would always talk about how exhaust affects global warming and I just wanted to kind of find out my own answers and like because I don't know like, so I would know really how it affects it. My name is Michelle Kaberluk and I am doing how salt water affects global warming. When I saw one, one um, project, she was looking at ver um, one of her variables was the temperature of water in salt water, what she was using. I did two experiments on regular water and two experiments on salt water. And my, I hypothesized that the more salt water you have, the higher the temperature will rise. And the less salt water you have, the lower the temperature will go. I thought that was, you know, when you look at even a small amount of temperature rising in the ocean, it can cause disastrous effects on some of the marine species out there. The light bulb represents the sun, and I measured it 15 centimeters from the surface of the water to the tip of the light bulb. It was interesting to see the, the profound difference, you know, with um, temperature. And these thermometers represent how high the temperature rises. So I put one on the bottom and one towards the top of the surface. And I did one experiment with saturated salt water and one with just fresh water, regular water. And so learning concepts like that I think was, was very effective. My hypothesis for my experiment was not very clear. But as I looked over my data, it turned out that salt water affects global warming because it is a lot thicker and stores more light than fresh water. This proved my hypothesis to be right. I think at, at this age, in the junior high level, um, I think it's just important to um, engage them in science and get them excited about it. And I think that this served its purpose in doing that. Um, and they'll be buckling down to uh, more difficult levels of science in years to come. But I think for them at this you know, junior high level, um, being able to have a little bit of playtime um, and learning you know, the process along the way was a good experience. Although the official slant of this science fair was global warming, the students weren't limited to a global warming in their subject matter. Everything from stinkweed to energy drinks was investigated, and displays ranged from plain to extravagant. With so many variables, judging something like this could be quite the challenge. There's four rows of projects. The pod three projects have got orange tags up in the corners, and they've already been judged by a panel this morning. So we're gonna focus on the high school area, and they're gonna be on the two rows closest to this row. They're gonna have some green entry numbers. Start from the top and brief me on the, your project. You guys can work in pairs or you can work alone and each one of your ballots counts for an evaluation. We are male abundances and we believe the crystals will get bigger because the harder the water, the bigger the crystals. Some of my questions are similar because we, we started off together and then we split and then we just started back again. So we combined them. Based on what you see, put them in another order from the first project to the third. Your top three choices. Okay, thanks girls. Thank you. I've been looking at how um, the students present themselves and also the content that they have um, behind the scenes, not necessarily how perfect it was set up, but what they really did to accomplish what they, what they were doing. And I realized that some of the ones that might not have looked too professional were actually really interesting and they had really thought it out compared to some of the ones that looked really good and had, you know, good presentation. Um, some of them, the content maybe wasn't quite so good. So I'm trying to kind of evaluate everything. It was actually quite exciting um, to see 
students really latching onto something, something that they're interested in, or even taking something that they're interested in and making an experiment out of it. You know, because I had these criteria, well, it has to be an experiment, it has to be an experiment, it has to have, you know, we have to be testing something. There's a lot of wires in here, and it spins, and the little axle right here will spin, and it will cause it to spin and the fan will move. You know, variables have to be controlled. And so, hmm, well, I love remote control cars. How am I going to make that an experiment? And they, you know, they found a way to work that into something that they're more or less passionate about. <laughs> See? So what's it made out of? It's a Lego bed, 9 volt battery, a motor, and a homemade fan. So um, that was that was pretty fun to see some of the creative ideas that, that they came up with to incorporate something that they really wanted to do. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that doesn't usually happen. Because the school district is based on pods instead of traditional grade levels, students are required to pass a set of standards in order to progress towards graduation. One of those standards was this science fair. It was mandatory for every student, but that didn't take the fun out of it. And maybe the follicle, follicles from the hair. And are bigger and smaller. Did you, yeah. Did you make sure that some... Yeah. And we were making sure that they had no gum up. <laughs> I think they were pretty excited for it because they had been, you know, kind of hinting all year, when are we going to be able to, you know, do our own projects? Because the um, experiments we had done previously was something that I had guided them through, and it would be something that we did together. Um, as a class, but in this case, I said, hey, what are your interests? And then we went from there. Three, two, one. Four. Safety guard is on. Compress. My name is Cameron Gray. I'm doing a potato gun. I had a potato in the front, and this thing wasn't sparking, so I took off the back cap, and um, I looked in there. It wasn't sparking, so I stuck my hand in there, bent the wire a little bit, and then I sparked it two more times, and then all of a sudden I looked in there again, and the flame just came out the back, and I lost part of my eyebrow, and my forehead airs. <laughs> um, yeah, Bobby burned his eyebrow off. And it was a project that I was pretty hesitant about, just um, potato gun, but actually only half an eyebrow. My eyes were burning and my eyelashes were gone and all my friends were laughing at me. <laughs> An unfortunate misfire for the experiment, but it was only part of the scientific process for this team. Although they had their setbacks, they eventually ended up successfully launching a potato 82 feet. Sometimes the greatest innovations come from testing different materials or fuels. We had our, con our hypothesis that axe was or propane was going to go the farthest. I knew it was already going to go the farthest because it's more flammable than axe. Axe? Yeah, axe body spray. <laughs> it was pretty messed up. I have. But then I had the idea with brake fluid, but it wasn't supposed to be a part of an experiment, and that's what blew off my eyebrow and forehead. Which, uh, which uh, part <laughs> this of one? This one. How different they are. <laughs> and then my forehead. <laughs> Just lost my eyelashes and everything. So you're going to think twice about sticking your face in uh, science experiments now? Yep. <laughs> and wear goggles next time. Kind of sucks. <laughs> I ended up coming around to the boys down here at the end with their little volcano and and once I started talking to them um, which it's really actually an attractive one too because it attracts your attention volcano always would but as I started talking to them I realized how much effort they put into their they made everything out of something we would put our baking soda in here and then we would put the string through here We'd grab the string. Like they used a pop bottle and they made their salt and flour volcano and they did and they made all these things by themselves. We would pull it tight so that it doesn't then we'd put a cap with a hole on top 
so that it'll keep the um, material from going over the cap instead of um, not erupting. And they knew what they were doing and they had their measurements and everything was really um, well thought out. We would put it in, stick it through the top. And at first, you know, you might not think it, um, but, but they had really done what I thought was a great job of, of you know, doing the data and, and actually ending up with the results that they were looking for from the beginning. We would pour it in real quick, put it, uh, take it away, and then we would let it erupt. And then when we, then we'd measure how high it goes. Some of the projects, they started out looking for one result, and sometimes through the course of the event and, and their, then their uh, experimentation, the, the data that they ended up collecting would actually answer a different question than what they started out with as their original hypothesis. shooting a basketball and the aim is to measure all the force angles and the distance of the ball to make a perfect shot every time and the way to measure it is to fill the trebuchet and that's that right some of them were real almost like textbook examples of a science fair project I know this step this step this step some of them were um, had a more creative bent to them where they were doing uh, problem solving. Um, it has to be 90 degrees parallel to the floor. But either way, everybody came across up. some types of obstacles where they were, there was always an obstacle where we, that, you know, they'd have to work their way through. <laughs> um, another large part of the science fair experiment was I paired up with the writing teacher um, and to meet some of their writing standards and research paper. So they did an incredible amount of background research, produced a research paper, um, um, you know, with their bibliography and everything. I think for some of them it was their first research paper they've ever written, um, and that was related to their science fair project. 13% of the leads on the exhaust plant died, and only 4% of the leads on the airplanes died. What do you think that means? I think that means that um, the exhaust kind of helps kill the plants. So when you guys were talking about weather, did you guys include all the variables like the weather, the wind? Yeah, the wind direction, the return, return. Uh huh. Yeah. When the parents came in and uh, reviewed, some of them asked me uh, which one was my favorite. It's really hard for me to see favorites, but uh, I thought it was pretty neat to see uh, students um, connect with. Uh, their, their um, excitement to learn and, and make a connection with, um, with uh, school function. Now, did you have fun doing this project? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We were always playing, boiling, taking pictures. Hanging by a hair. Oh, yes, we are beautiful. We are so, now that the displays have been taken down and put away, what will these kids take home with them? There's a discovery that people dream more when they're happy and more relaxed. And we know it's not a good idea to ignite brake fluid inside a three inch PVC tube. And the debate rages on whether lighter hair or darker hair is stronger. 88 grams was dark hair, so it turned out that lighter hair was stronger than darker hair. But it Who knows? One of these kids may someday describe the true nature of quantum energy or discover the cure for cancer. Maybe design a better mousetrap. You think you have the release point figured out? Um, almost. We put too much duct tape on it. For now, though, let's let them have their fun. Ready? Three, two, one. Thank you everyone for your help in the story and thank you so very much Henry Oyumik and congratulations to Jenny Dill and to Brittany Johnson. They were the contestants that won first place in Unicleet then went on to more competition in Golovin, Alaska and competed in Anchorage, Alaska. They won first place in Unicleet 
For what? Well, they compared 409 to Lysol to find out which cleaned best. Which one did? More on that next week. God bless you all. We'll see you again next week. Different homes of Jane Ivanoff and or another Ivanoff and then Richard Ivanoff homes over here. A lot of Ivanoff. Yep, and Aru, Aru Ivanoff. Back up in there's some more Ivanoff. Up in there, Katoonan. You're from uh, South Dakota. Was it a, a, another kind of a small town like this? Or was it? Well, I thought it was a country boy. Worked on a farm and worked for a truck for a life, driving life called Coleman. So, uh, have you ever lived in a big city? No. I'm what? not no city slicker. <laughs> I love it here, nobody steps on my toes.